Good, good. Today we are, are going to continue to press on in this series on naked and not ashamed that we've been dealing with. And um, before we move into it, Pastor Katana, I just want to tell you, tell us a little bit about how it's going, um, how you're learning, um, how you're adjusting, how you're loving me more, and <laughs> you're seeing my purpose, and you just like thank God for Felix. I'll never sin against him again. Um, you know, you know. <laughs> I'm pushing it, right? Yeah. yeah, tell us how's it going. Good. So I, I hope you all are, are um, gleaning from the word. You know, anytime uh, we have to stand and bring a word, God deals with us first. Yeah. yeah. Um, he challenges us and deals with us. And we always, you know, I always say, I'm not getting up there because I don't want no lightning bolt coming down on me for, you know, saying something but not <laughs> living something. Um, so this week, is, these past few weeks have been very challenging, um, just taking it personally. Um, you know, allowing God to just go in and purge my heart um, and opening myself up to correction and adjustment, which is always so important. So often when we speak of marriage or we speak of relationships, we point, we, you know, we tend to point fingers at each other um, and say, you know, did you hear that? Or what do you yeah. think about that? Yeah. Um, because we're looking at our own self. Yeah. We're trying to, you know, fulfill something in ourselves. But, you know, the challenge, I guess, through this, this, um, series is just to allow God yeah, to yeah. deal with you personally. Yeah, you know, yeah. we all have um, relationship issues, marriage issues. I mean, that's, it's just part of life. Um, and the way that we can re correct it is by returning to uh, the heart of God in all things. And so that's, that's, been, that's the challenge for me. That's the challenge, I believe, for all of us Amen. is to just really get to the heart of God for ourselves um, and make those adjustments that he's calling us to. Amen, amen. One of the things we're going to do as part of this series, we didn't say it this um, morning, but um, one of these weeks we plan on having a panel, just a diverse panel of people who um, from varying walks of life, marriage, divorce, single, all that good stuff, and we'll get a chance to engage um, because we're learning when you're leading a congregation, you have people with a whole lot of different backgrounds that come to the table and you want to be able to address them. Um, we jokingly said this morning that uh, on Wednesday night, we really get to flesh this out a little bit. Wednesday night are a lot of fun because people come and they bring their stuff and they talk about it. And so it opens up some dialogue. So if you hear stuff that's challenging, uh, we want to encourage you to come on Wednesday so we can talk through that a little bit. Good. Yeah, let me encourage you all to come out on Wednesdays. Wednesdays is when we can get down and get dirty yeah. with the yeah. questions with the controversy uh, that goes yeah. forth it's between like Jerry the male and the night. female. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we have a lot of fun. We yeah. do it in love. Um, yeah. And I believe that we walk away, you know, hearing a different perspective, hearing the heart of God. Yeah. And it helps us to understand each other because um, we are two diametrically opposed human beings. Yeah. Um, you know, males yeah. think one way, females think another way. But when we can come to the table and flesh it out, I think it just really helps. Yeah. Um, it shows that transparency. It shows that we're open to uh, yeah. hearing from God. This series have made you more submissive. You think so? <laughs> yeah, you better keep preaching then. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's hitting me first. So I'm having to adjust to me not, you know. Um, so especially what we're going to say this morning, some of the things that uh, the man I am learning, and then we're going to go into the word, that I got to fix things. I, you know, when it's broken, I have to take the hit, right? Um, so I am learning to take the hit more and more. And initiate the process. So today we're going to go through uh, this text and hear what God is saying. So opening question, uh, let's pray. And then we can go to words. So Father, we give our hearts to you. Bless Pastor Katani and as we share. Uh, open our hearts to receive. Uh, open the ears of this congregation to be more like you. So we give ourselves to you that you'd be glorified. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. By way of introduction, there's God's word where God speaks. And then there's a place where the culture speaks or where the community speaks. And I am learning more and more that when you listen to culture, culture never seems to align with what God is saying. Mm -hmm. And so what you end up having is you have the believer or the people of God having to wrestle or the tension with what do I do? Do I adjust, you know, towards the world or do I adjust towards God and obey God? And the same is true in our relationship. God has a word of our lives and the enemy has a way of trying to intervene and mess up what God wants to say. But it comes down to us hearing God versus hearing the world, isn't that? Don't you think so? Yes, yeah. I think, you know, because we're such a visual society. Yeah. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll look at all the talk shows and everything. Yeah. And some of them will sprinkle just a little, um, enough of God in their speech where it captures your, uh, your attention. They'll put a little bit of truth in there. But at the end of the day, 
it might not work out for you that way yeah. because yeah. we should always stand on the word of God. And so we're going to see a story where yeah. um, a little bit of truth was told, but it was twisted. And it's what caused man to fall. Amen. Genesis chapter 3. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Today we're going to deal specifically with only the first six verses. And then uh, next week we'll pick up verse 7 and kind of walk through that. Here's what I want you to, to lock into as you listen to, listen to Genesis chapter 3. Up until now, the series on naked and not ashamed has been, uh, I'm going to use the metaphor or the, this side of the equation, meaning that there was total transparency, total honesty, total all that stuff in the relationship because sin had not yet entered. So Genesis 2 and 25 said the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. After today, if the Lord says the same, you're going to see a shift. They're still naked, but you're going to see now, as opposed to them being unashamed of their nakedness, they're sewing fig leaves together. And now they're exposed to their nakedness, and this new word is introduced into the text, and they're going and they're hiding from the presence of God. So here, they're naked, and God sees their nakedness. And I'm speaking metaphor. I don't see that in a literal sense. All of a sudden, they're naked, and they're covering their nakedness from God as if God has not already seen them. So what happened? What happened in between there? And how can we prevent um, ourselves from finding on the other side of the equation? Because a lot of us, if you're like me, or like Pastor Katani and I, or most couples, you're on this side of the fence. You've messed up. We've blown it. And how do we recover? So we're going to be spending a lot of time in the up couple of weeks, upcoming weeks talking through that process of recovery to fix the wounds. So read uh, my lovely wife, read verses 6 and uh, I'll, I mean one through six, and then we'll explain and go to work. Amen. Okay. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of this fruit of the trees in the car, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle, in the midst of the garden, Neither shall you touch it or lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, <laughs> you will surely not die. Yeah. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Okay. Verse 1. Repeat after me. Say the serpent. The serpent. When everybody say, say the serpent. the serpent. Now, let me say this. Most of us, when we read this text, um, if you're like me, from Sunday school, from the early days of salvation, up until you mature, we read Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, through the lens of the devil showing up in the Garden of Eden and the devil having the conversation with Eve. Mm -hmm. And so when we read um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the majority of us in here don't see serpent, even so the text says serpent, we see devil. Mm -hmm. Can we be honest, y'all? We see devil, and we say Satan is there, and there's Satan doing, and Satan this, and all that good stuff, and he came in. But I want us to take a moment just to really look at this very, very carefully. Um, verse 1 says, now the serpent, and that's the Hebrew word nahas, and what nahas means, uh, it just means serpent. Okay, just, it just means serpent. Nahas does not mean Satan, nor does it mean devil. Matter of fact, if you were to do some etymology work, etymological work on the word Nahas or Satan, I mean uh, serpent, you will find that this is the same word that's used throughout the Bible whenever the word serpent is used, okay? It's the same word that you find, I believe, when the uh, Israelites were in the wilderness and they were being bit by these fiery serpents, the same word, Nahas, um, when God told Moses a solution to the serpent biting the Israelites was to build a brazen serpent and put it on a rod and lift it up. It's the same word, Nahas, uh, serpent, that's being used. God did not tell Moses to build a, a brazen a demon or Satan and put it on a rod. It was a snake that he put up there. So that's very, very important that we lay that out out front. We're not talking 
about the devil. We're talking about a literal snake that's doing some things. And I'll talk about the, the enemy inhabiting or coming um, in that form or, 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 or let me use the word influencing. But I don't want you to see this as anything else as the serpent now being used. Okay. Now the text continues on. It says that the serpent itself was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God has made. Tell us about crafty. What does crafty mean? So Tell the word crafty it. can mean wise and it can mean prudent. Um, cunning, sneaky, sly, overhanded, devious, deceitful, uh, prudent. It's practical. It was also wise, yeah. cautious, careful, sensible, judicious, um, having or showing good judgment and restraint, especially in conduct and speech. Yeah. It was clever at attaining one's end, interacting with one, and with deceptive measures. So this, this serpent, you have to realize that it was just one of, the, one of God's creations, yeah. and you can't look at the serpent. It, that was just his character. His character was crafty. Yeah. His character was prudent. He was slick. He was wise. That's the way God had made him. And so the enemy takes, looks at this, this serpent, and he enters into this serpent to deceive man. Okay. Now, the reason that's important, when the text says that the, the serpent was uh, more crafty than any of the beasts of, that the Lord, of the field that the Lord had made, I want you to lock into the fact that if the enemy is going to come at you, he's not going to come at you with something that won't get your attention. You kind of get what I'm saying? If the enemy is going to engage you in dialogue, if he's going to get you to sin, he's not going to get you to sin with something you don't like. Come on, y'all. I just hate this, but I'm going to do it anyway just because I want to sin. No, you won't do that. You'll, you'll deter, you'll run. So the reason this is some, some important information is because the text says that God had created this beautiful creature. And this thing was very attractive. And when one saw it, they'd want to look at it because of how wise it was, how crafty it was, how slick it was, how beautiful it was. And so the enemy now enters this thing and it engages this man and woman and it, it has such ambiance about itself that it catch, captures their attention. Now we need to lock in that. I want to talk through a couple of slides on the screen. If we can put the first one um, up there so we can walk through this uh, to hear what God is saying. Amen. If they can get the, if they, while they're working, yeah, here, okay. So in this passage, it's very important that we understand the serpent then. The reason, that we, the reason I don't want you to call the serpent the devil is because the serpent is simply the vehicle that was used by the enemy to approach this husband and wife. Mm -hmm. Okay? Say, just a vehicle. Just a vehicle. Come on, everybody say it again. Say, just a vehicle. Okay, because God didn't create um, the devil in the garden. I mean, he did that. Don't get me wrong. But this particular serpent that's encountering the woman was just a vehicle that the enemy was using. Now, number two says the serpent, because of its crafty nature, could be symbolic of anything that serves as a source of distraction to take our eyes off God and cause us to miss the word of God for our lives. Okay, this is very, very important, okay. Um, because of the crafty nature, it's symbolic of anything that the enemy will use to distract you and to distract me to get us to take our eyes off of the things of God. So here's what we were saying earlier. God releases a word and the enemy will come. He will use whatever it takes to distract us, to get us to miss what God is saying, and to get us to do what he wants done. Very, very important. You want to add anything to that so we can move? So, yeah. so you have to be aware that, you know, the enemy can come in all forms and shapes. Yeah. It just, it's just, in this, in this incident, he used the serpent as a, a vehicle to get there. But he can use me, he can use yeah. you. Yeah. He, he will bring to whatever whets your appetite, that's yeah. probably more than likely what he's going to come and present to you. He's not going to present something that offends you or something that you just don't like. He's going to find a way to manipulate because he's wise, he's crafty. He's going to find a way to come to you that catches your attention. And that's exactly what happened with, with uh, Eve in the garden. He came to her, and before she even knew it, she was engaged in dialogue uh, because he, he, he appealed to her. Yeah. And she liked what she saw. Go to the next slide. If we can go to the next one, um, I want us to see this real quick. So the serpent then is symbolic of any unauthorized person or entity who invades your relationship. And don't miss the word, 
with malicious intent, malicious intent, and the primary purpose being to cause us to defy God's word for our life. I was sharing with Pastor Katani this morning, I was sharing with the first service, that when Katani and I were going through some challenges in our marriage, um, and um, I, I'm not, I have to keep saying this because it, it may look that way, not calling her sisters serpents, okay, I'm not doing that, okay, but... but <laughs> But, but she'd call her sisters and say, he ain't acting right. He ain't whatever. And here's what her sister would say. Leave him. Leave him. Girl, look what I, I left mine. You need to leave yours. Sister's still single. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, and, and the point was, that was not the word of God released. You kind of get where I'm going? And, and the point we want you to lock into is that when it comes to the enemy, he will use whatever it takes. He will use family members. He will use our parents. He would use brothers. He will use sisters. He will use each other in the relationship to occupy us, to distract us from being who God would have us to be. And we need to be cognizant and fully aware of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now go to the next slide. Let's hit this next one. Take a minute to... Um, so the enemy can use any vehicle he chooses to wreak havoc in our relationship. Let me give you a feel. So here's what we were saying last week, right? When I said to Pascatani, man, you're argumentative, right? She has some options. She can either be um, the God woman and listen and make the adjustments because remember the chart on the screen. I'm exposing a blind side or the same thing. She could come to me because she sees a blind area in my life and she can say, Felix, this is what's wrong with you. I have options. I can receive what's being said because I can't see it or I can retaliate and it ends up in an argument or an altercation. When that happens, here's what I want you to hear me say, the enemy has a gotten one of us. Does that make sense? So, so here's, here's how the scripture says. Be sober, be vigilant, because the enemy is like a what? Roaring lion to do what? Seeking whom he may what? Devour. So here's what that looks like. He, you sitting there having dinner, and he's sitting there having dinner with you. Right? And then he says... Let me see which vehicle I'm going to use today. And then he waits for an opportunity, and the moment we give him a foothold, he's going to jump in either here or he's going to jump in here, and then this happens. Come on, y'all don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about, right? Don't fool yourself into thinking that's just you because you don't want to own up to the fact that the enemy's riding on board. Here's what we say, that's just my flesh. Well, you doggone right, it's your flesh. He's got your flesh. All right? Very, very important. So look at the last one. We should be very, very careful of becoming our own serpents. Yeah. Be very, very. Come on, y'all. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, be careful. Tell the other neighbor, say, neighbor, you be careful. Very, very important, very, very important that we need to be very cautious and very care, um, uh, cognizant of the fact that the enemy is looking for people, for him to use. This is why I don't want us to make the mistake exegetically to say the serpent is the devil. The serpent was simply a vehicle that he entered into to approach the marital relationship. And the point of this is his intent is to disguise himself such that when he shows up, we don't even recognize him. All of us looking for pitchforks and red tails and horn. And that book is sitting right next to you. Not in church, of course, but you know. <laughs> She's saying it too. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, okay. you know, it, I mean, it's, it's just so, I mean, we've all been used by the enemy. We've all, yeah. we've all sinned, so just raise your hand. We didn't all sinned, amen? Yes, yes. You know, let's just <laughs> confess that. And we've all been, been, been um, used by the enemy. He's deceived us. And it's up to us to walk in, walk in our holiness and in, in God's, ways to be able to recognize that because sometimes it becomes so common you know yeah. your situations your problems your issues or everything we learn to work in chaos we learn how to just deal with things not realizing that if we don't put an end to it if we don't cut it off 
then yeah. he just comes in a different form, a different way, yeah. a different, a, a, in, a, in, in through a different vehicle. But we have got to learn to shut everything down yeah. um, and just stay focused on who God created us to be. Because it could be just as simple as, um, I didn't want my chicken baked, I wanted it fried. And you know what? Uh, like, well, then you'll fry it yourself. I want you know, big and so, <laughs> and it's just those simple little things like, oh, so I've been home and I didn't cook dinner, I didn't work all day, I didn't came home and cooked, and you're gonna complain because the chicken is baked instead of fried? You got a lot of nerve, you know. And just, just that little thought starts trickling through your mind. You start replaying and replaying it. That's the enemy. That's how he deceives you. That's how he. That's how he just t subtly starts to nag at you. And yeah. the next thing you know, y'all fighting over, you know, yeah. whatever. You just yeah. because of a piece of chicken. Yeah. <laughs> remember though he is the enemy of transparency right so his goal is to get you over to sin not keep you in holiness you kind of get what I'm saying so his, he can do whatever he can to get you to cross over so shame can enter your relationship so look at how the text switch and look at how it transitions right so chapter 3 continues look at, look at verse um, 1b Verse 1b says that Satan now comes in through the serpent and he uses the sermon and he says to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Um, woman said to, to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. You'll hit that in a little while. Verse 4, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. And I like verse 5. Here's what he says. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. Man, we're going to talk about that um, in the upcoming weeks. And you will be like God, he says, knowing good from evil. Satan did two things to Eve. Two things. Here's the first thing he did. He challenged her on the accuracy of God's word to her. Okay, um, she heard what God says, and you can talk about that in a little while, but he came and he challenged her on the accuracy of God's word. There's a problem with that, right? And then he goes, not only did he challenge her on the accuracy of God's word, he then challenges her secondly on if you don't do what God says, what God said he will do is really not true, Right? And that's what the enemy will do. will fool us into thinking we have leeway. Talk about that a little bit, and I'll flesh out that piece a little bit. Talk about that, yeah. So um, Eve, as, as the serpent approached Eve in the garden, um, he asked her a, a, a direct question um, about, you know, what did God say about the tree? And so in her response, in her, well, what God said about the tree is found in verse 16, 1 and 16. It says, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, evil, you shall not eat from the eat, for in the day that you eat, you will surely die. When Eve interprets it, er, interprets back to Satan or to the serpent what he, um, God had said, she adds, she takes away and she adds to it. We are not allowed to eat, you know, from the tree in the right. midst of the, the tree of good and evil. We can't even touch it. You know, and, and nowhere in God's command that he'd say that you can't touch it. So right then he had her. He had grabbed her yeah. because she had already twisted what, um, what the command was. And so once the enemy can get in, when he, when he can just latch on to just a little piece, so then he just starts diverting her attention, not so much about the good and evil, but you know why God doesn't want you to touch it? Because you're going to become like him. Don't you want to be like him? So he brings this opposition into her. She starts processing it like, well, why would God would want to withhold that? You know, why would God want to do that? And, and the enemy is subtly telling her, oh, he's a selfish God. He just wants to be, you know, the man in charge. And you, you, can, you can partake of this and you can have the same powers. You'll have the same abilities. And, and she begins to process this. And because her flesh begins to, to want it, she falls. Yeah. And that's, that's the goal of the enemy. That's the same thing he did. He knew his failure. He knew his shortcoming. Mm -hmm. He knew his failing. He knew that he wanted to be like God, which caused him to end up where he was. And he noticed there's no good on the other end. 
that he uses this, what I'm going to refer to as a predictive statement. He wasn't lying to her. You will be like God, knowing good from evil, because he was trying to say you will be like a God. You will have the abilities of God to make decisions, to make choices for yourself. And let me, here's the problem with the text, and here's the problem with you and the problem with me when we try to fool ourselves into thinking that we know better than God. Okay, because when God releases a word and God says, I need you to do this or not do this or do this or not do that, the moment we make the mistake of thinking or doing what God did, what God told us not to do, we have fooled ourselves into thinking that we're better than God. We fool ourselves into thinking that we know more than God. We fool ourselves into thinking that we're wiser than God. So here's the lie. You will be like God, knowing good from evil. And the problem with Eve is the text says here is that when she saw, when she saw, when she saw, right? There's a couple of things with that. Number one, one of the biggest mistakes Eve made was she engaged the enemy in conversation. Biggest mistake she made. Engaged the enemy in conversation. Come on, repeat at me. Just say, don't do it. Don't do it. Come on, say it again. Say, don't do it. Don't do it. Okay. The problem in not doing it, you, you always need to be cognizant of who you're talking to. Because remember with me, he's not going to come at you looking like the devil. And she made the mistake, and you can always recognize them because, number one, they're going to challenge you against the Word of God that's been released over your life. And secondly, they're going to challenge you with the result of what God says. Don't you want to take a hit of this? You know it's going to make you feel good. And check this out. Well, God created the weed, didn't he? That <laughs> slipped out, amen. I'm in Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> But you get what I'm saying. Use the very word of God, and we will fool ourselves. We need to be cognizant of that. Don't make the mistake of engaging the enemy, okay? And then because she listened, because she engaged him, the engagement resulted in temptation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that make sense, guys? Okay? Engagement resulted in temptation. Temptation. I'm going to connect this to the marriage in a little while. And because I think we're sharing principles today that transcends the marital or any relationship. Engagement resulted in temptation. Very, very important that you not miss that. Couple, anything you want to add before I put these slides on the screen? And so when, when, Eve, when Eve started, when he knew that he started reeling um, Eve in, is because the fact that she thought, you know, I can be equal to God. Yeah. I can be just like God. That's the same thing that God... Satan kicked yeah. out of heaven. Yes. <laughs> um, he was the chief worshiper. He was created yes. to worship. He was a worshiper. And when he was performing all this worship and seeing how the, the, the angelic realm was just worshiping God, he wanted it for himself. Like, I'm the one creating the music, so why y'all ain't, you know, I should be getting some of this. And so his jealousy, when God created man, he hates us. Do you understand that? He yeah. hates us because we were created to, um, in the likeness of God. We were created as worshipers of God. We essentially took his place. And so he is venomous on causing us to fall, causing us to sin. So he, he went into that garden with an agenda like, yeah. oh, so you didn't made man and woman and y'all, you come down in the cool of the day and y'all chill in there thing. I'm going I'm, I'm to I'm I'm attack all of that. I'm going to tear all of this down. Yeah. And he was successful because Eve looked to be equal with God. In Philippians, we, there's a passage of Scripture um, which is, it says um, how opposite Jesus was. In, in Philippians, it says, Who he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Even Jesus Christ himself was humble enough to take on the form of a man. He did not yeah, try yeah. to be equal to God. He, he, he did. He walked out the purposes that God had designed for him. And if Adam and Eve had only walked out the purposes, God would have told them all about the tree of life. He would have introduced it to them. But because of their greed, because of their fleshly yeah. desire, they decided, you know, we're going to go and do this. So truth can get so twisted up. Yeah. So we have to be careful of who we allow to speak into our lives because... What could have been is no longer. 
And that's yeah. why we're in, in yeah. the situation we're in today. Next slide. Put the slide up on the screen. I want to talk to these two points and then we're going to shift. Okay, number one, some marital applications. Number one, never allowed unauthorized individuals to provide input or attempt to speak life into your relationship. Okay, come on, y'all. All right? Amen, 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 amen. Don't allow, don't allow an authorized individual, Oprah. <laughs> amen. Come on, y'all. Y'all know I'm right about it. Amen. Yeah. Oprah said no. Okay. Unauthorized individual. Dr. Phil, right? On and on and on. I think you get the picture quite well. Your girlfriend. That, that Satan has entered her and she really want your husband so she's going to give you advice so you can leave him so she can get, kind of get, yeah, y'all get it, yeah. Your boyfriend, don't allow unauthorized individuals to speak life into your relationship. And number two, I love this one. This is very, very important. Um, I wish I had known this when I was younger. I'd be a lot better in my relationship. Be careful when making household decisions as an individual. Always consult your spouse for their input. Amen. Okay, I'm going to say it again. Always consult your spouse for their input. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. Always consult your spouse for their input. Are you guys hearing me this morning? Are you hearing me? All right. Women should be hollering, listen at him, husband. Listen at him. You know, always consult your spouse for their input. Right? I'm going to flesh this out in a little while. I was sharing with First Service. I'm washing my car uh, yesterday in my driveway, and my neighbor comes over, and my neighbor says to me, he says, hey, Felix, nice car. Is that a Porsche? And I'm like, I wish. I'm like, no, dude, that's not a Porsche. But I knew he had a Porsche, and I knew he had a Porsche in his garage. And I said, yeah, I don't have your money because I'd buy that car you have in his garage, right? And then he kind of hangs his head. And I'm like, what's up, dude? And he says, my wife made me take it back. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it, it reminded me of our story. Right? When I was, I bought that car. She's like, no, you're going to take that back, right? Always consult your spouse because the enemy could use that. And, and I can't stress this enough. We kind of hinted it, but we skipped it yesterday. Um, I mean, last Sunday, especially in the area of major financial decisions. Come on, y'all. Don't be coming home talking about, look at this house I bought us. No. <laughs> okay. She has a vision for the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> you guys get where I'm going. Consult your spouse. Consult your spouse. Because when you don't consult your spouse, the enemy has entered one. And watch this. And you will bring the enemy home unknowingly. All right? Watch the text. Watch the text. I mean, you got to lock into this. It's, it's like, you know, and, and you'll see this in a little while. It's not like Adam is over here working in the garden, doing his thing, doing what he got to do. And you, you, would, you would think that if, if some strange person that she had never spoken to her showed up before and is engaged in her, you'd think she'd say, hold up, let me go check with Adam. I don't know who you are. Yeah, yeah. You would expect that, right? Poor girl, she just goes ahead and makes a decision and then gonna come home to Adam. Adam. I mean, bring Adam, look what I got. Visualize that just for a little while. Always, always consult your spouse. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, anything you want to say before we switch? Okay, now let's switch. Let's switch. So now look with me. Look, look at look at um, Adam's role in this because this is this is this this bugs me. And I want us to really take a moment to look at this um, because I spent a lot of time week one dealing with the foundation, and I want us to look at this now. So look with me at Genesis chapter 3. Um, jump down to verse 6. I need everybody to look at that. Say, if you, say amen if you're at verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband. And look at that phrase. Who was what? With her. And he what? Ate. That's scary to me. Okay? Here's what I just picture I just painted. This verse says, it's not like Adam is over here working, right? And then the enemy shows up. And speaks to his woman. Adam is right here. And he's watching Eve. And he's watching this strange man pimp his wife right in front of him. (laughs) 
girl, you sure looking good. And Adam's like, you think so? And he, I mean, just, and, and he's right here. He's right there because when you read, when you read the text, it, it's used in second um, person plural pronouns, right? So what that means is, is, is he engaged. Yeah, he asked Eve the question. Eve responds, but he re, Satan or the, or the serpent now speaks back in the plural sense. In other words, he's speaking to her and he's speaking to him, you shall not. You, those are plural. In the English, it looks like he's speaking a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but he's engaging both of them. And Adam is there silent the whole time, not saying, I got a problem. And I want to build that. I want to flesh this out because you got to remember with me, here they are, naked and transparent, naked and not ashamed. And then we're going to see next week, they find themselves here and Adam is sitting here the whole time this thing is going down and he's doing nothing about it. Yeah. Not protecting his woman. Will I protect you, baby? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> there ain't no man coming up in here, up in here. <laughs> Oh, no, oh, not in this house. Oh, not up in here. No, bro. And, yeah, thank you, brothers. Yeah, ain't that kind of party. Yeah. That's a whole lot of years of mortgage I done paid. Uh-uh. <laughs> you got that dog all right. I ain't paying half for nothing. Yeah, we we going to work this out. You got, yeah. So, so, so he, stood, he stood silent. He stood silent, and he allowed this thing to go down. Now, the reason I want to point this out, because this is the crux of what I want to share with you, what we want to share with you this morning, because we want you to walk away from here knowing that you don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. We want you to walk away from here knowing that you don't have to have that marriage or that fight at home, or you don't have to go through this crazy stuff that you go through. You can stay over here in nakedness and transparency, and the shift doesn't have to happen. But you can't be like Adam. <laughs> I can use some snake shoes like that. You, you, can't, you can't do that. You have to speak up. Yeah. Come on, say speak up. Speak say up. it again, say speak up. speak up. Ladies, if you're sitting next to your husband, don't get in trouble, but just tell him speak up. <laughs> you got you to speak up. Does that make sense? Now look at this. Look, let me show you some things in the text. Back up with me to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Back up with me to Genesis 1 and 26. And if you're there, when you get there, say amen. Notice what verse 26 says. Of, um, yeah. Then God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And notice the plural pronouns. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the heaven, over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping things that does what? Creeps on the earth. Man had dominion. You guys are tracking with me. Go over to um, verse 28. Go to verse 28. Verse 28, okay? Look at verse 28 one more time. Then the Lord blessed them, that plural pronoun again, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds, over the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the ground. Okay? Then jump over to Genesis 2 and 15 real quick. Let me show you like that real quick. And the Lord God um, took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden for two purposes, to work it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, you are surely to eat of every tree in the garden, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat it, you shall not surely die. Okay? If, if, if one least, the least Adam should have done is that when Satan started talking and had Eve, did God really say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Here's the least Adam could have done. Well, by golly, he told me that. Or he could have said, Eve, you, you restated that wrong. The least he could have done. Yeah. Or, or correction. Correct or did some correction. But lock into this. Lock into what's happening here. 
The enemy comes and incarnates himself or takes on this, this serpent or, in, or influences the serpent, whatever term you want to use, and they don't even realize who they're talking to. But if I'm Adam and, and this serpent now all of a sudden is engaging my wife in dialogue and I know I have dominion, my first word is, yo, dude, yo, 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 yo. Yo, you got to check this out, okay? I mean, who you talking to? Let me tell you why I'm so animate about this, okay? Because if you remember with me, when God created Adam, God sat Adam down when he saw that it was not good for man to be alone. I wish I had somebody in here. If it was okay for God to talk, to, for man to talk to the serpent, he wouldn't have gave it a mean. He, he'd engage the serpent, but God sat him down. And God brought every living creature in front of Adam, and Adam gave them their names. And the text says, and whatever Adam called them, that was their name. The reason I'm passionate about that is the only reason the serpent is called serpent is because Adam named him serpent. Then all of a sudden, the serpent has flipped the script, and the thing that he had dominion over is now causing, I wish I had somebody in here, is now causing him to sin. What's wrong with that picture? He gave up the dominion that God had given him, and he did not exercise dominion over the thing, and it caused him to sin. If I'm Adam, you better, I named you. This is how my mom and daddy would say, I brought you in. Yeah, you get it. Yeah, that's how I would have said it. Especially if I gave you your name, you're going to sit here and talk to my woman who authorized you. I almost said a bad word. That poor guy. Lord Jesus. Yeah, yeah. But you oh, know, that, Adam, that would not Adam have been had good. creative power. Yeah. Adam had creative power. And when he was naming the Adam, when good. he was, when God gave him the authority to name the Adams, he was seeing their characters. It wasn't like, you know, monkey came. Oh, monkey. He didn't make, he, he observed them. He watched how, oh. they, how they reacted, how Girl, their you don't know what character was. Yeah. And when he saw the oh. serpent, and yeah. he saw how crafty and how slick it was, he said serpent. He knew the yeah. char char characteristics of the serpent, yet when it came face to face in the garden, he bows down. I, I, I like that. I like that. that oh, give me some. Give me some. <laughs> That'll work. Yeah. I like that. Because character means name, right? Mm -hmm. so, so he knew that Joker was playing games. I wish I had somebody, but he let it. Oh, y'all got to get this. He knew he was pimping his woman, but he let him. You see the problem? Don't, don't be so hard on Adam because you knew the consequences of drugs, but you still do it. You knew the consequences of premarital sex, but you still do it. Come on. You know the consequences of lying. I like that, but you still do it. Something is wrong. Yeah, yeah. We have dominion. We have dominion. Don't be so hard on Adam because I do the same thing and you, by golly, do the same doggone thing. And we move from here over something that we have dominion over? Please. So look at, look at this, look at this, look at this. He could have exercised. Girl, that's some good stuff right there. <laughs> He didn't protect the garden. You get it? Work it and keep it. Here's how I said it a couple weeks ago. Protect and serve. Anything that comes into my house or my house, I'm responsible for. This is the importance of the foundation, right? This is the importance of the foundation. We talked about that week one. I'm in control. Okay, and when God gives us dominion, them dominion, when I drop the ball, she steps up. And it keeps balance in the home. So here's how she said it to me last week. And I was so painful. You're not being a gentleman. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm move over here because something's coming back up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but you kind of get where I'm going. Now, let me, let me walk this out with you. So here's what I want to say, then we're going to stop. And you can break it, honey. Um, 
That thing did not have to get to the point of temptation. If I were to ask you what happened in the garden, why did man fall? Here's what you're going to say to me. They disobeyed God. That's what you're going to say. And they partook of the fruit. I'm going to push back a little bit and I'm going to say to you, it didn't have to come to that. It didn't have, it didn't have to come to that. That's, this is an important principle I'm sharing with you. It didn't have to escalate to the point of choice. Remember how I said with you, she engaged him in conversation, and as the conversation ensued, he tempted her, he beguiled her, and he presented her with choice. I'm trying to say it doesn't have to get to choice. I'm going to write a book about this, but my, my theology on the fall is the fact that man stopped doing what God called him to do. You kind of get what I'm saying? That's going to be my theology of the fall is the man dropped the ball. It ain't that his wife gave him the fruit as he dropped the ball and he caused the enemy to cause his wife to go get the fruit. I wish I had somebody <laughs> in here. You see what I'm saying, okay? Matthew chapter 4, verse 11 kind of puts it this way. Jesus, after he was baptized, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. To be tempted by the devil. And I'm going to say to you, it never got to the point of temptation. Because here's what the enemy says. You've been fasting for 40 years. After he, 40 days. Oh, that's a long time. Yeah. That's like wilderness stuff. Dang. It's like Israelite stuff. Hey, God have made stone out of bread too. You know, 40 years. So the enemy comes and the enemy tempts him. And here's what he says to him, right? Um, if you're the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Make some hot water cornbread. Come on, man. You know you're hungry. And notice what Jesus did not do. Man, I sure am hungry, man. I could use some bread right about now. He didn't even engage the enemy in dialogue. Here's his response. Man shall not live. By what? Bread alone. But by what? Every word. That does what? Proceeds out of the mouth of God. The enemy comes and engages him, and he acts like the enemy isn't even there, and he utters God's word. You kind of get what I'm saying? Then the enemy takes him to another place and takes him on a high mountain and says, um, so you've got a little bit of word. Okay, you want to throw word at me? I'm going to throw word back at you. Okay, because I know it too. I used to be up there before you were created, before you were born. And he says... Here's what it says in, in the word that you just quote to me. Jump off. I'll give you everything you see because Scripture says that God's going to dispatch a bunch of angels and he's going to catch you before you dash your feet against a, fall, a stone. Here's what Jesus said again, right? Thou shalt not tempt the Lord. Y'all know the Scripture. You kind of get what I'm saying? And then as the, the, as, as the enemy kept trying, notice this. Jesus got to the point where he said to me, um, get thee behind me, right? And listen to what the Scripture says. And the devil left. Yeah. I like that. I like that. The conversation never continued to develop to the point where Jesus was presented with choice because he shut it down before it even began. Right? Here's how 2 Corinthians says it. Take every thought captive and do what? Submitted to the things. Ah, come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on. Is this making sense? But here's what the enemy will do. He will come at you. You'd be on your computer writing your sermon. Then up in that little Facebook window that you shouldn't have open in the first place while you're studying. Something will flash across the screen. And hear what you do. In the middle of your word. <laughs> then you got the mouse that's on the word God. Gonna move the mouse. Oh, come on, y'all. Yeah. And they're gonna pick your finger up on top of that mouse and gradually <laughs> trying to press that thing to see what it is. No, 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 no. I'm trying to help us all. Shut it down. Are you with me? Shut it down before it develops in a conversation. Shut it down because the Bible is clear in James. Resist the devil and he will what? Flee from him. Draw near to God and he will do what? Draw near to you. We've got to learn to shut it down. And because we don't shut it down, it develops into choice and we more than times make the wrong one because we want to be like God. If the enemy can get you to choice, he's got you. 
Because you might get away once. But oh, he's going to keep coming because he's going to know, oh, I got to talk her. <laughs> and he's going to keep showing up and showing up. So listen to this. Never allow any temptation, any temptation. I don't care how good she look. I don't care how fine he is and I'm not gay. Yeah. Don't let it escalate to the point of sin. You have dominion. And you have been empowered to shut it down before it presents you with choice. Mm -hmm. So, brothers, let me help you out. Katana and I don't have this problem. If you're walking down the street and she's at 4 o'clock, you walk like this. Shut it down. <laughs> shut it. <laughs> shut it, shut it, shut it. Say, so what you doing? Don't worry about it, girl. Just guard me. <laughs> shut it. Shut it down. All right? Shut it down. Just shut it down and protect yourself. Does this make sense? Don't give the enemy. And it's the same thing in our relationship because here's what we've learned from this series, from, even from this lesson this week, is that, that when, before it gets rough in our relationship or if, if I rub you wrong or you rub me wrong, before your head get to doing... <laughs> <laughs> That's TV one to move. I'm going to say, shut it down. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to say, get your hands off me. <laughs> <laughs> shut it down. <laughs> shut it down, right? And we do that for each other. I think we'll be fine, right? You'll stay in naked and transparency because you won't give the enemy room. We would not give him room. Tony, pray for us. Sharon, then pray for us. Um, Amen. That God would move and have Amen. his feet.